Peace of Christ be with you. Hey, before we settle in for the sermon, I just want to ask us to have a couple minutes of just silence. Just a moment of silence for those in Paris that are grieving. But not only those in Paris. There's a shooting in Chicago last night. There was a murder in New York last night. It's a child that died of hunger today. There are refugee crises and families caught between borders that don't have a home. Paris does not happen in a vacuum. Let's have a moment of silence to just remember this world God so loves. God, we don't have the words, but we know that when we don't know what to pray, your spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words, that you might intercede for us and pray for us. So pray for this world. Pray for those that are grieving in Paris and in every place where there is suffering. Come, Lord Jesus, and come soon. Amen. Friends, let's groove. Jesus went up the mountain, and when he sat down, he began to teach his disciples, saying, Blessed are the... Come on, come on. Yeah, yeah. Blessed are the... For theirs is the... Blessed are those who... For they will be... That's interesting tonight. Blessed are the... For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who... For they shall be... Blessed are the... Yeah, there we go. (laughs) Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be... That's right. That's right. They shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the... Blessed are the poor, or bless, <laughs> ah. oh, I'm going to groove this. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Verse 9 tonight. It's amazing when things you plan long ago coincide with current events right now. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called children of God. Jesus has a very simple call for us tonight. It can't really be elaborated much. It's just plain spoken truth. To be a Christian a follower of Jesus, a follower of Jesus' way, is to be a peacemaker. No equivocation. No and but. The call of Jesus on his people is to be a people who make peace. Is that not what the world needs right now? From Palestine to Paris from Missouri to Ferguson, from the streets of Holland, Michigan, to the streets of L.A., wherever you go, what we need most of all, is it not? It's peace. We need a world that is pursuing peace. Peace. So that all people at all times and in all places might know the kind of experience God intended for his creatures, for humanity. God wants us to be a people of peace, which means that every single day 
that we use our powers, our resources, everything that we have in order to bend them towards that purpose, to make, to make peace. But what is peace? I mean, it's easy to talk about peace, and it's one of those things that we have in our minds, peace. We put them on billboards, we put them on bumper stickers, we sing songs about them. But what is peace? Do we have a proper vision of it? Because if we can't see it, it's hard to live into. Maybe begin by what peace is not. Peace is not, for example, a feeling. When Jesus says to be a peacemaker, he's not saying, he's not evoking a particular feeling. It may involve feelings, but that can't reduce peace to what it is. You know, there's that, what's that eagle song, Bruce? I got a peaceful, easy feeling. And she won't let me down because I'm already standing on the ground. I don't, I don't know who she is. I don't know what the ground is. <laughs> but they're singing about this peaceful, easy feeling. That, that song made those guys millions. It's the kind of idea that peace is merely just sitting by Lake Michigan, watching the sunset, holding hands, just your toes in the sand. It's such a good feeling. That is not what Jesus is talking about. It might lead to that. It, you might have a feeling, but peace is not a, a peaceful feeling, okay? It's bigger. It's more complex. It's more robust. It's more interesting. Peace is not merely just a ceasefire between enemies. It's not merely just the absence of violence, though it's a pretty good place to start. What do, what do they... Um, they call those old guns in the West, Smiths and Wessons, or what do they call them? Peacemakers, right? There's this idea that if we just have guns, other people won't shoot each other. I think that's absurd. I understand where that comes from, but the idea of peace is more than just a ceasefire of, of violence. The kind of peace that Jesus is calling for, the kind of peace that Jesus wants us to be about and participate in, is not merely just a people of God packing so that we don't shoot each other. I heard a candidate on, on the trail suggesting that if everyone in Paris was packing guns, this would not have happened. I'm just going to say this, and I'm not, I don't get into the politics often on this, but I'm just going to say that God's word will always trump ignorance, Okay? Peace that Jesus is calling us to be about, the people of God, at all times and in all places throughout history, is more than just a ceasefire between those with weapons. It's just more than just the absence of violence. It will include that, to be sure, but it can't be limited to that, is my point. And peace is not just appeasement. Peace is not synonymous with just appeasement. It's not just looking the other way. It's not just giving in to conditions. There are things that you have to take a stand for. There are things that you have to say enough. Jesus said that I did not come to bring peace but a sword. I'll set brother against brother, sister against sister. You might have to leave your parents Jesus is not advocating violence when he's saying that, by the way. What he is suggesting is that there are loyalties that can divide. And if you have to choose between your relationships and Jesus, you always choose Jesus. That the call of Jesus will divide at times. That there is gospel convictions. That there is first principles. That means that we have to take a stand. And the way we take a stand is the way of Jesus. It is not the way of this world. It calls us to a radically different posture, a radically different kind of habit of being. To be a peacemaker is not to say that we appease everyone, that there are convictions that we have to have as a people of God. But what is peace, then? If peace is not just an easy feeling, toes in the sand, watching the sunset on Lake Michigan, if it's not merely just the absence of violence, 
If peace is not just an, an appeasement so that we kind of all just lack conviction so that we all can kind of get along, what is it then? Well, peace in the Bible pivots around this word shalom. Do you know this word? It's one of our great words. It's one of those words that we need to groove deep into our soul so that it plays over and over and over again. In the Bible, when we talk about peace, we're talking about shalom. And shalom is the webbing together of justice, fulfillment, and delight. Shalom is the webbing of justice and fulfillment and delight. To be, have peace is to have a qualitatively different kind of relationship. It is a status of being with God, with yourself, with others, and with all creation. It is to have ultimate reconciliation with all things, with God, a, a reconciled life with God, a reconcil reconciled life within yourself, a reconciled life with your neighbor, a reconciled life with creation. Shalom is what God made this world for. Shalom is what God is doing in this world. Shalom is our ultimate end, just as it was at the very beginning. You were made for a life of justice. You were made for a life of fulfillment and joy and being. Shalom is what you were made for. To be a shalom maker is the call of Jesus on his people right now. Because it has always been the call of God on his people. Blessed are the peacemakers, the shalom makers, those who are making justice, those who are enjoying fulfillment and delight with God and each other and with creation. And they shall be called children of God. That is the promise. If you are a peacemaker, you will be called children of God. To be a child of God. The beatitude right before this one in verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Because when you see God, you begin to do what God does. You begin to mimic God. That's what children do with their parents. The other day, uh, my Ella, who's three, uh, came next to me on the couch, and I was reading a book, and Ella took a, a book off the shelf. It was like a really thick one, you know, like Tolstoy. And she like came and sat right next to me and she opened up the book and she just kind of started reading or looking like she's reading, which is really funny because she's three and she doesn't know how to read. But that's what she saw her dad doing, sitting on the couch, opening a book and reading. And that's what children do. They, they mimic, they copy their parents. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. What do we see God doing? What we see God doing throughout all of the great big story of salvation is shalom. God's story, God's salvation story is a story of shalom. From beginning to end. God's story of salvation is about peace and about peacemaking. God created the world and all its wonder intoxicated with his glory. It experienced the webbing of justice, fulfillment, and delight at the very beginning. That's what we were made for. He created a place where he and his creatures communed, where there was no strife or animosity. God called it all good, very good what he made. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. It was peaceful. It was deeper than just an absence of violence. There was a mutual communion, intimacy, relationship with God and with each other and with creation. And then there was disobedience. Our desires turned inward and we left God. Sin entered the world. And what did we do? We hid. We covered ourselves in shame. The darkness set in. 
the shalom was shattered. And ever since then, the darkness we have felt, we experience, and it's in us. But God, God wasn't surprised. God knew this was coming. And God made a covenant, a promise to a particular person that says, through you, Abraham, I will raise up a people, nations, and you'll be a new kind of vision. You'll be as numerous as the stars, numerous as the dust on the ground. But through you, I will bring salvation. Through you, I will bring peace back into this world. That covenant promise was fulfilled, giving birth to Israel. And Israel, Israel, as a nation, as a people, was called to be an alternative vision for the world, a different kind of witness. God wanted to be their king. Originally, Israel was meant to have no king, no leader, save God. But the people of Israel, wanting to be like everyone else, begged God for a king. Let us be like everyone else. And God warned them, if you take a king, you will become like everyone else. That king will want to follow the ways of the nations. Your sons will be inscripted. You'll go into battle. You'll be fight rather than trust me. Trust me. They said, no. We want to be like everyone else. And so God gave them a king. In the long history of Israel, there's always this tension between God's call on their life to be a people of peacemaking, a nation of peacemaking, and the desire to be like everyone else. Underneath of that is really about trust. Do we actually trust God's word? Do we actually trust God? to be a God of peace among us or not? Or do we need to take the power into our own hands? Do we follow the way of God, calls God's call on our life? Or do we look like everyone else? The prophets of Israel always calling, always calling, always calling Israel, God's people, to an alternative way where they don't sacrifice justice for their privilege. Where they don't enjoy their fulfillment at the expense of others. Always, always, always the prophets calling out, calling out, be a different kind of people. Be a people of shalom. Be a people of justice. Be a people of love and of righteousness. Trust me, trust me, say the prophets. From Isaiah to Jeremiah to Amos, the major, the minor prophets, always calling God's people to be a people of peace. Waiting for that Messiah to come, to restore peace to us. And that Messiah has come. The covenant promise reaches its culmination in a man named Jesus from Nazareth who took up the call of the prophets and not just the calling but embodied the very presence of God among us. Word made flesh. And through him, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, through him, God was pleased to reconcile all things by making peace through the blood of his cross. Through Christ, God has accomplished what we could not give ourselves. Peace and reconciliation where the curse of the fall is reversed in him. Where shalom can be once again a possible possibility in this broken and dark world where once again Christ's light might shine in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. Jesus inaugurates us into his kingdom. Though it hasn't been fully consummated, we are called to participate now. Participate now in Christ's ongoing work of reconciliation in this world. When Jesus was resurrected, he showed up among the disciples, and his first sermon out of the grave was this. Peace be with you. Check it out, John 20. Peace be with you. 
Again, I say this again to you. Peace be with you, Jesus says. When we give each other the peace, we share each other the peace, we're not just, giving each, uh, we're not just saying a particular kind of feeling. We're, de- we're declaring to each other a declaration of a new age and a new reality. We are called to be a people of peace because peace is what Jesus has accomplished for us and sent us into this world to be ambassadors, witnesses of his peace. Here's the fundamental point. Peace, my friends, begins with God. It always has and it always will. Peace is God's salvation work among us. Salvation doesn't begin when you die, okay? It begins here and now with these bodies in this place. The Christian story isn't waiting for us to just pass away so that we can go into glory. The glory will come. Salvation begins now, in this place, by what Jesus has accomplished for us. You are called to participate in salvation now among us. You are called to experience justice now. You are called to experience fulfillment now. Jesus is calling his people to usher in that kind of context and condition for others. Blessed are the peacemakers, the peacemakers, the shalom makers, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Peace begins with God. We get off the rails when we think that we can have justice without Jesus. We get, we're never going to arrive at the station of peace if we never bring God along with us. To be peacemakers means that we have to once again, like a child, learn how to radically trust God and God's word and God's ways, which are not the ways of this world. It is the way of turning the cheek. It is the way of praying for your enemy. It is the way of not walking one mile, but also another mile. Jesus calls us to a new way of life. And that new way of life opens up the possibilities of life, a life of shalom for you and for all of those around you. The simple call on us tonight, my friends, is to make peace. We are called to be peacemakers. What does that look like practically? I'm going to name just a couple things. And I want to personalize it. These are just things I'm working on in my life. But to be a peacemaker, I think, begins with thinking, thinking, thinking contextually. Contextual thinking. And what's the context? Our context is this, that we have all been reconciled through the blood of the cross. We are all people in Christ whose lives are reconciled. That's the context of the gospel, which means that we no longer need to fear anything. But it also requires us to think more deeply about the strife and divisions in this world. Where do they come from? What are the sources? What is the history We need to think contextually contextually about all of those areas in our life and society, our campus, our culture, where there is pain and division and strife. What is the context that is created about that? We need to think, my friends, about peace and about the conditions that make for peace. Our tongue and our ear. So much division happens with saying too much. I can't count how many times I wish I did not say to Kristen something. I can't count how many times I have failed as a brother in Christ by just not, by by just speaking when I should have just shut up. So much division happens with our tongue. Have you ever had that where you, you just, but it's out. You can't, you can't have the hoover and like suck that back into your, into your mouth. So much division happens with our mouth. Sometimes we just have to learn not to say something. We need to think contextually, but we also need to think and sometimes not to speak. Not to speak so that we can hear, so that we can listen. 
I honestly believe that the world would have less strife, animosity, division, violence if we really learned how to listen to each other. Not just our words, but what's underneath those words. We listen to the pain beneath the words. When we just listen. I think to be a peacemaker requires us to talk less, be slow to speak, and to listen more. Let's be the kind of campus that listens to each other, that comes alongside those who are hurting and just listens, where we speak less and we listen more. I think we need to be, to be peacemakers. We need to learn the means and methods of peace. We need to educate ourselves about the particular issues that require reflective thinking. We need to network with others that are doing good work of peacemaking. We need to strategize and we need to organize. We need to show up in places, but we need to think about the methods that make for peace. Jesus' call on us is not optional. We are called to be peacemakers. So let's do that well. Let's learn from those who have really taken up that cross and learn from them. And finally, we need to be a people who practice reconciliation. Jesus says, before you go to the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go. First, be reconciled with your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. First, be reconciled with your brother or sister. Is there anyone in your life right now that you need to be reconciled with? To be a peacemaker begins there. It doesn't begin by just trying to like fix all of the world's problems. It begins in our own hearts and lives and sometimes in our own families. Ooh. It's hard sometimes to find the reconciliations there, the ones that are so close because the love is so real and the pain is so real. Who do you need to be reconciled to tonight? And reconciliation begins with repentance. Without repentance, there can't be reconciliation. Without reconciliation, there cannot be peace. To say, I'm sorry. Can you forgive me? And to be the kind of person that can extend forgiveness. You know what? None of us are here because we got this figured out. None of us are here because our lives are together. They're, we're not. We are all broken clay. We are all people who are in need of help. And one of the helps we can give each other is forgiveness. But that forgiveness begins with repentance. I'll just say this to you right now. If there's any time I've ever done anything to you or our ministry has done to hurt you, I'm sorry. I want to know that so that we can be a people who walk together in good relationship. To be peacemakers doesn't mean we hold grudges. It doesn't mean we bury this stuff. It means that we have to initiate. And where we're wrong, to say I'm sorry and to walk a new way. And that new way comes down to this, just simply trusting the peacemaker. Trust the God who gives us peace. Through him, Christ, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile all things, all things, all things, things in you, in your life right now, by making peace through the blood of his cross. The cross is not just a symbol of suffering. The cross is the very means by which God has achieved and actualized a new age among us, a people free to be peacemakers by taking God's peace, embodying it in such a way that we go into this world, into this world to make peace for each other. Amen? Would you pray with me?
God, we thank you for your simple call on us tonight to be a people of peace. Bring peace into our lives, our hearts, our families. Help us to make peace on this campus. Help us to go out into this world in whatever vocation and calling you have for us, whether it be in business or education or law or engineering or science, whether it be in marriage or friendship or within a church, wherever we stand, Lord, may we use our powers to bring peace into this world, to make peace. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, and all of God's people said, amen.